I said, who's that? He said, Jeffrey Dahmer. We think he's a homicidal maniac. Turns out that Dharma show was quite popular. Turns out the videos I did on that Dharma show were quite popular. So there's blood all over the knife, yet he's very calm. There's nothing rushed about this. And I think Netflix has capitalized on it because straight away they've released a new series of conversations with Dharma. At least this is going to come from him and the people around him rather than a dramatization of it. But before we get cracking, if you're new to my channel, hi, my name is Dr. Elliot Carthy. I am a forensic psychiatrist in the UK. And on my channel, I do videos on mental health, mental illness, LGBT health in a variety of different formats that hopefully people learn something from. If you like that sort of thing, do check out some of the other videos and do consider subscribing. Otherwise, on this video, we should be able to talk about the relationship between trauma and violence the difference between being ill and being insane, the difference between regretting something and actually being remorseful, psychiatric defences of not guilty by reason of insanity and diminished responsibility, and a little bit about why gay bars and queer spaces are so important to help people feel safe, even today. Ready? Let's crack on. When I first went in to see him, it was a very small interview room. Which might be a bit intimidating, given the nature of what he's done. There was Jeff um, sitting in the corner of the table. I was incredibly nervous because this was something that I felt was way over my head. The awareness of those feelings in the room and in the moment are so important. I, I, I Pretty much every video, I end up talking about the concepts of transference and countertransference because they are so important and so useful, whether in the context of mental illness or not. Transference is the emotions that the patient transfers to you. And that is really important to understand because if you can cotton onto it in the heat of the moment while you're experiencing it, it can give you a window not only into that person's internal world, but also into the way that they relate to the world around them, to objects in the world, to people in the world as well. You can then be much more aware of your own countertransference, which is the emotions that you then respond with back to the patient. When I arrived, just seeing the faces of the police officers, that's when I realized that something big was happening there. And emergency workers are at much higher risk of post-traumatic stress disorder than nearly any other profession. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a chronic anxiety disorder that can result from a single trauma or a series of traumas, and it tends to have a triad of symptoms where you get hypervigilant, so you're feeling on edge all the time and it doesn't take much to trigger that fight and flight response, you get re-experiencing of the trauma, usually in the form of flashbacks or nightmares, and then avoidance of triggers of that trauma. The trauma is often in the line of work that you do in the emergencies that you see, and you're gonna end up seeing many, many, many more emergencies. You can't pick and choose which ones you see. You can't plan and predict when something really traumatic is gonna be right in front of you, and you certainly can't avoid the risk of being re traumatized by new emergencies that you end up attending. And that's why it's so important that there is a culture and an understanding of this and support and treatment offered for people so that PTSD doesn't end up spiraling also into comorbid depression, substance misuse as well, um, where the impact on people's lives can just escalate and escalate and escalate. I got a phone call, a fellow from our main TV station, I want to talk to you about a client of yours. I said, who's that? He said, Jeffrey Dahmer. We think he's a homicidal maniac. The word maniac comes from the Latin maniacus and the Greek maniakos. It means affected with mania or raving with madness. So in this case, the word maniac is being used to describe somebody that they think is, is very mentally ill because how could somebody that isn't mentally ill do something like this rather than using the term in the sense that we would use the term mania for somebody that has bipolar affective disorder. I did ask him about why he was telling the police everything, why he was rendering a confession. And he said, Wendy, they, they found so much in my apartment. You know, the gig is up. So I would prefer to continue talking with them. He had already had his mind made up. So he's confessing because to deny it is futile, but maybe there is also 
a lack of the emotional response that comes with feeling remorseful or even embarrassed or shameful for what he's done that for other people might put them into that fight and flight state where they want to keep avoiding or denying that they had any involvement in these acts. So potentially this lack of the same emotional response, or even if you are experiencing an emotional response, that you're not necessarily inhibited by that emotional response. Maybe? He had already confessed. So I knew Dahmer didn't have a defense. So I said to him, what do you want me to do? He said, I want to know why I am what I am. So I told him, I can get a good psychiatrist to come and talk to you and plead you not guilty by reason of mental illness, insanity, but I need doctors to tell me they can support that. And medicine and the law don't really see eye to eye with this. In fact, most people, even with severe and acute mental illness, will not meet the legal definition for insanity, because insanity is a legal term, not a medical term. The legal test for insanity in the UK is defined by the McNaughton rules. You need to have a defect of reasoning caused by a disease of the mind to the point that you either didn't know the nature or the quality of the act that you did. So you didn't really know what you were actually doing. Or if you did know what you were doing, you didn't know that it was wrong. And that's commonly accepted as, as meaning legally wrong. It's not just about being ill, it's about how did that illness affect your ability to understand uh, what you were doing and the difference between right and wrong. I didn't seem to have the normal feelings of uh, empathy. Do you ever consciously think to yourself, geez, why don't I have these feelings that normal people would have? I did wonder about it. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person, and it's thought to consist of two main processes. One is cognitive empathy. Are you aware of the feelings of another person and the emotions that underpin why somebody may be behaving and acting in the way that they do? In other words, can you can take the perspective of another person, something that we call theory of mind? Anatomically, this has been linked to the dorsolateral and the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, and therefore is dependent on executive function. The second one is affective empathy. This is resonating with the feelings that have been evoked in another person. This has been linked with the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the limbic system, and the basal ganglia. Deficits in either can lead to behaviours that on the surface may suggest callousness or a lack of empathy, but they can actually uh, be underpinned by very, very different processes. It's deficits in affective empathy that have been linked with psychopathy. Psychopathy, while not being an actual medical diagnosis anymore, is commonly accepted as representing one of the most severe subsets of antisocial personality disorder. It was adamant that there wasn't any huge traumas that would have caused him to do these things. It wasn't like he was sexually abused or beaten. The one thing that Jeffrey did tell me and Jerry Boyle about his childhood that really affected him was this uh, constant bickering between his parents. This desperation to be able to explain why he's done what he's done. Um, and it would be lovely if you could accurately explain violence simply through having experienced trauma, but we know that's not the case. Now, there is an association, but it certainly is not a simple cause and effect. There may be some direct links through changes, for example, in social learning that can happen as a result of trauma, or indirect links through the development of antisocial personality disorder or substance misuse. But ultimately, violence is multifactorial, and trauma is a risk factor. But being a risk factor does not equate to being a cause. It's one risk factor that needs to be aligned with multiple other risk factors to uh, understand why somebody might be violent in that way at that particular point in time. Yeah, there was a feeling of excitement mingled with a lot of fear. Interesting that he used the word fear. Excitement and fear are underpinned by pretty much the same physiological processes, that primitive fight and flight response, but perhaps with a different cognitive bias in how these same physiological processes, these same symptoms are actually interpreted by our brain. There is a substantial body of evidence to suggest people with prominent psychopathic traits have autonomic hypo-reactivity. Their fight and flight response is more blunted than people without these psychopathic traits. This has been conflated a lot with the idea that psychopaths
psychopaths don't feel fear. And actually that is not underpinned by a big evidence base, though admittedly this is a very difficult group to study. One alternative theory is that while people who have prominent psychopathic traits may experience fear, they may be less likely to interpret these emotional and physiological reactions that form part of that fear response as indicating danger and therefore a need to alter your behavior in response to it. I.e. that fear doesn't inhibit you and stop you in the way that it would for most people. It was true that he did have a sexual disorder in an attempt to try and get him through the insanity plea. I know that one of our experts uh, went into it a great deal. A paraphilia is a type of impulse control disorder that's driven by so-called deviant sexual interests. So these preoccupations need to cause really marked impairment in your function in multiple aspects of your life. I'm a forensic psychiatrist. I was an expert witness in the Jeffrey Dahmer case. My expertise is in the paraphilias, which is in layman's terms, the sexual deviation disorders. People have something different or aberrant about their sexual makeup. This witness that they've got is a forensic psychiatrist. That's the same medical specialty that I do. So forensic psychiatry is the specialty of assessing and diagnosing mental illness, but in people that have criminally offended in some way. Sometimes these people are in the community, but a lot of the time this means working in prisons and secure forensic hospitals. And we have a role at contributing to criminal trials, both before the trial, at assessing people during the trial when we may give evidence in the proceedings and give recommendations around sentencing options for example, though they are just recommendations, and then after the trial in terms of assessing and treating people while they're in hospital or with, they're within prison. We assess and we treat the full range of mental illnesses, so whether this is schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, addiction, personality disorders, etc, etc. Most of the time this is working with adults, though there are some that subspecialize in working with children and teenagers. How did it manifest itself that you were troubled by it? What were you feeling? A lot of guilt, indecision over whether I should confess to it. Suppose this is an opportunity for us to talk about the difference between regret and remorse. Regret is more about the unhappiness with the impact that being found out has had on them. And usually that comes down to, I regret it because of the punishment that I'm now experiencing. And sometimes, you know, that's valid. That punishment can be enough to reduce reoffending again in the future. But it's different to remorse, which is the uh, emotional awareness and appreciation of the impact of what you have done on the victim. It requires victim empathy. Detectives allowed him to smoke and to have as much coffee as he wanted as well. It kept him calm and on track. And I think without those, we wouldn't have gotten all the story because he was willing to talk longer and longer as long as he could continue to have those two things. As far as being in prison goes, asking for coffee and cigarettes at a time that actually you could smoke indoors, I, I, it's not... People have asked for much more, <laughs> and people do ask for much more than that. Both caffeine and nicotine have stimulant effects, but they can also be quite calming and comforting in other ways. So this is kind of like a pharmacological safety blanket, if you will, while he's recounting these really graphic um, and very, very dark and very sadistic crimes. You had freedom, so you were comfortable. I mean, we get dressed up and go to the bar the bars had beautiful music. People always wanted to dance. Gay bars are, are, are meant to be still a safe place to be yourself. Be gay, be bi, be trans, be queer. If you're straight, you're welcome, as long as you respect that it's not about you, it is designed to be a safe space for queer people. Don't come in and dominate queer spaces, handies, <coughs> or bachelorette parties if you're American. As always, let me know what you thought in the comments below and I will see you for another video very, very soon. Love you, bye.